We're going to look this morning at the words at the end of the passage we read a little earlier, found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12. And Matthew says in verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out, till he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. You, you can look at a photograph of somebody. Or if it's somebody from history, perhaps a painting, a portrait of them. And when you look at this photograph, this portrait, it doesn't tell you everything about the person. But it tells you something about them. It tells you certain things about them. Or you may read a short pen portrait of somebody, a description of them using words. On the, the back of a book, there will sometimes be a few lines telling you something about the, the author of the book. It doesn't tell you everything about them, but it tells you something about them in, in just a, a few lines. And here in Matthew chapter 12, Verses 18 to 21, we have a, a short pen portrait of, of Jesus Christ. It doesn't tell us everything about him, but it tells us certain things about him. Certain things about him that it's good for us to hear and, and take to heart. Maybe you are fairly new to church. And maybe you wonder why it is that Christians are so taken up with Jesus Christ. Why do they talk about Jesus Christ so much? Why, why do they sing these hymns that are full of, of Jesus Christ? Well, what is it about him, you, you, you might ask? Maybe you are confused as to why Christian preachers or other Christians speak to you about Jesus Christ and the need to, to trust in Jesus Christ, the need to follow Jesus Christ, the need to love Jesus Christ. Maybe you, you just struggle to see why, why this man who lived 2,000 years ago, so many miles from here, is relevant to you today, is, is relevant to the, to the world today. And for those of us who do trust and follow and love Jesus Christ, maybe we've lost some think of the enthusiasm that we once had for him. And have ourselves lost sight a little of, of his importance, his importance to us. Well, I hope this morning that by looking at this short pen portrait of Jesus Christ, we will see him afresh and we'll see how great he is. See how important he is. See how much we need to, to love him and trust him and follow him. 
Jesus Christ, as we, we come to these verses in, in Matthew's gospel, ha, had been in conflict with the Pharisees to, to the point that they, they wanted to kill him. It says in verse 14 that the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. And so we're told in verse 15 that, that Jesus withdrew from, from Capernaum for a while. Not, not because he was scared of the Pharisees, not because he was scared of their, their plots to kill him. He, he knew that, that he had come in order to die, but he also knew that it was not yet the time for him to die. And so when they started plotting to, to kill him, he, he withdrew for, from that place for a time. And yet, as he withdrew and went elsewhere, we're told that many people, verse 15, followed him. And he healed all their sick. But, verse 16, he warned them not to tell who he was. He, he did not want unnecessary fuss and popularity to get in the way of the, the work he had come to do. And Matthew says in verse 17 that, that all of this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Uh, and Matthew then quotes uh, a prophecy in Isaiah. He quotes Isaiah chapter 42. Uh, and the first of the four servant songs that we have in the book of Isaiah. And here in verses 18 to 21, quoting Isaiah chapter 42 verses 1 to 4, we have this pen portrait of Jesus Christ. And what does it tell us about him? Well, first of all, it tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ is perfect, is excellent in every way. Jesus Christ is God the Son. Come into the world as a man. Uh, later on in Matthew's Gospel, in the, the opening chapter, speaking uh, of Jesus' birth, it says, The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. He is God the Son. Come into this world as a man. Uh, and this quotation from Isaiah 42, it begins with, with God the Father saying four things about his Son. First of all, Jesus Christ is a servant. Here is my servant, God the Father says. Jesus Christ gladly, willingly, lovingly, served his father in everything. You think of Jesus Christ as a boy growing up in Nazareth. You think of him going to help Joseph in the, the carpenter's shop. And Joseph gives him a hammer and some nails and the boy Jesus starts hammering those nails into a, a piece of wood. And as he does that, as he hammers those nails into that piece of wood, he does it for the honour and the glory of his Father in heaven. He's serving his, his Father in heaven, always in, in everything that he does. And as he went on through, through his life, and as he reached his teenage years and his, his adult years, and as he began his public ministry in everything he did, he was always serving his father, honouring his father. And as his life progressed, that service to, to his father led him to, to preach the gospel. And his service to his father took him ultimately to the place of death. It took him to, to the cross. It took him to, to Calvary. But always, all of the time, in every detail, he, he's serving, serving his Father, serving his, his God and Father in heaven. Jesus Christ is presented to us here as a servant. 
And he's presented to us also as, as the chosen one. God the Father says of him, here is my servant whom I have chosen. God the Father gave Jesus Christ a, a task to do, a, a task that only he could do. He was the chosen one, the only one who would save God's beloved people from sin and judgment, from sin and hell, and would give them life and heaven. He was chosen for this, chosen for this great task, sent into the world with, with this great task. And he was loved by his Father. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love. How Jesus Christ is loved. How God the Son is loved by God the Father. God has no beginning. When there was nothing else, there was God. When there was no world, there, there was God. God has always been one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there always has been and always will be perfect and holy love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was that point in time when God the Son became a man, he came into the world as a man, and the Father loved him. Twice during Jesus' life, God the Father spoke audibly from heaven, his baptism and his transfiguration, and said, this is my Son whom I love. Father loves his son because of who he is, because of everything that he does. And the, 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 Jesus Christ then is delightful to his father. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. On those two occasions in, in Jesus' life when the Father spoke audibly from heaven and said, this is my Son whom I love, he also said, with him I am well pleased. God the Father took great delight in everything that Jesus Christ did, everything that Jesus Christ said. There wasn't a, a single thing he ever did that was not pleasing and delightful to, to God the Father. What, what, what are the things you take most delight in? The things in life that you, you delight in most? Well, well, they are the things that please you most, aren't they? And nothing is so pleasing, so delightful to God the Father as the life and the work of his beloved son. Here is my servant, whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. And before moving on from this, I just want to make a very simple point of application. And it's this, that if God the Father loves and delights in Jesus Christ, God the Son. And so should you. And, and so should I. So should all of us. Do, do any of us know better than God? Do, do any of us have a better idea than God as to what is good, as to what is beautiful, as to what is delightful? And if God the Father tells us that his Son is the best, the, the most beautiful one that there is, the, the best, the most beautiful man to have ever walked the earth, if God the Father tells us that the work of his Son is the most perfect and delightful work that has ever been carried out, 
then should we not stop and consider Jesus Christ, God's Son? Should we not consider who he is? Should we not consider the work that he has done? Should we not love him? Should we not trust him? Should we not follow him? Should we not delight in him too? Let me set you a challenge. Read, read through the, the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Read through them carefully. Thoughtfully. Looking at Jesus Christ as you do so. And then see if you can find anyone, anything in your life, in the world today, in history, anyone, anywhere, anytime, that is more worthy of your love, more worthy than your delight, of your delight, than Jesus Christ. The Song of Solomon tells us that he is the chief among 10,000, that he is altogether lovely. Jesus Christ is perfect. He is excellent in, in every way. The one whom the Father loves, the one in whom the Father takes delight, and we too are called to love him and delight in him. But then secondly, in this, this pen portrait of, of Jesus Christ, we, we see that Jesus Christ has done a, a great work. He has done a great work. The, the, the second half of verse 18, God the Father says, I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. God the Son was given a, a great work to do. He was chosen for a great work, a great work that only he could do, the, the work of salvation. He, he came into this world as a man in order to do that work. He, he came into the world as a real man. He, he did not cease to be fully God, but he became fully man. He had... Real flesh and blood, a, a real human nature. And he knew the li limitations that that brought. So when Jesus Christ came into the world as a man, took on a, a human body, he, he couldn't be in two places at once. He, he got hungry. He got thirsty. He got tired. He was a, a real man, a, a real human being, just like us. Just like us in, in every way, except that he was without sin. And to enable him to do the great work that he's been given, God the Father put the Holy Spirit upon him. I will put my Spirit on him. Jesus Christ was filled with the Holy Spirit without measure. And the work that he did, the work that the Spirit enabled him to do, it is described here. I will put my Spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He, he, he proclaimed the justice of God. The Holy Spirit was upon him to enable him to, to preach a message. We, we have this described to us beautifully in a, another quotation from, from Isaiah, the book of Isaiah that, that's quoted elsewhere in, in the Gospels. Isaiah chapter 61, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives, to release from, from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Holy Spirit was upon Jesus Christ and he, he preached, he, 
he brought her a message. The message of heaven. And that message here is described as justice. He will proclaim justice to the nations. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ proclaimed that that God is just. And that God will judge the world with justice. And that's deeply troubling for us, isn't it? Because Jesus Christ also proclaimed that We are all sinful. We've all sinned. We we will all be dealt with in justice. But Jesus Christ also proclaimed that he is the one who satisfies God's justice. He is the one who satisfies God's justice on behalf of his people. Jesus Christ proclaimed that he would die to take the the justice, the, the, the just judgment of God upon sin in the place of his people so that they can be justly forgiven. He said in chapter 20 and verse 28 that the Son of Man came to give his life as a a ransom for many, to to pay the price, to suffer the the, the justice, the the, the judgment of God upon sin. That his people would be forgiven and saved. He proclaimed this, the the, the justice of God, and that he is the one who saves people and satisfies the the justice of God. He's come and he's done a, a great work. But then a third thing we see in this pen portrait of Jesus Christ is that he is is kind and tender. He's kind and tender. Verse 19 says, he will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the the streets. This simply means that though he preached, justice and though he preached with with authority he he was not full of himself he he was not aggressive and harsh as as he did it he he proclaimed the the good news about himself with kindness with with tenderness Uh, and was so very different to that in in the pharisee in that to the pharisees that the pharisees at the beginning of this chapter were so harsh in the way they were dealing with the people Jesus Christ here is contrasted with them. He's not harsh, but he's kind and tender. And his kindness and tenderness was seen especially in the way he dealt with people. And especially in the way he dealt with the weak and the needy, with those who came to him conscious of their sin and seeking his forgiveness. And these two lovely pictures are used to help us to understand that the kindness and the the tenderness of Jesus Christ, a bruised reed, he will not break. And a smoldering wick, he he will not snuff out. Think think of reeds that that grow along a a riverbank. And in Jesus' day, reeds that grew along the riverbank would, would often be put to practical use in, in different ways. They, they could be cut down and they could use to make pen, be used to make pens or um, flutes, musical instruments and, uh, and so on. But reeds that were bruised, reeds that were damaged, reeds that were considered to be good for nothing, They were simply thrown away and destroyed. But Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ will not break a bruised reed. Bruised and damaged people came to him. People came to him who were bruised and were drooping under the weight of their sin, under the weight of their guilt, under the, under the burdens of life in a sinful world. And they found him to be kind, to be gracious, they found him to be patient, they, they found him to be forgiving. 
A bruised reed he will not break. Or or think of a a candle. A candle that is lit, but virtually all of the wax has has melted away and and the the wick barely remains. And there's only the, the faintest flame burning upon that wick. And we think to ourselves, oh, we need to snuff that wick out. (laughs) Jesus Christ does not snuff out a, a smoldering wick. People whose faith in him, people whose love for him were real, but but had grown dim, who were struggling, who were finding the way hard. He was kind, he was tender, he encouraged them, drew alongside them, taught them, helped them, strengthened them, prayed for them, restored them. The kindness, the tenderness of Jesus Christ, a bruised reed he will not break, a a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. And, And now that Jesus Christ is ascended to heaven, he remains as kind and as tender today as he was when he, when he walked the earth. And he continues to deal with his people in, in such kindness and, and tenderness. The, the world that we live in can be a very harsh place, can't it? It can be a very unforgiving place. In some ways, it's a strange world that we, we live in, isn't it? Um, we, we hear so much today about respect and, and tolerance and, and, and so on, and we, we've, everybody's got to accept one another and, and all the rest of it, and yet at the same time, we have things like cancel culture and people being hounded for a passing comment they might have made on social media 10 years ago. There is so much harshness. And perhaps some of you live, some of you work maybe day by day in harsh environments where there is nastiness and backbiting and perhaps you're weary. You're just weary of the, the harshness of the, the world in which we live. And perhaps you wonder where you can find grace, where you can find Kindness, where you can find tenderness, where you can find patience, where you can find forgiveness, where you can find these things in Jesus Christ. He is kind, He is tender. He's not soft. He is strong, He is firm, He rebukes sin with all authority and calls us to repent, but when we come to him in true repentance. He is so very kind and tender and forgiving. And the fourth thing then we're told in this pen portrait of Jesus Christ is that that he brings hope. Verse 21, in his name the nations will put their hope Told at the end of verse 20 that he leads justice to victory. He will one day judge the world with justice. And the message of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross to to satisfy the, the justice of God and bring salvation, that message goes throughout all the world today. People whom Jesus Christ, people who turn to him and trust in him, they they are saved, they they, they are forgiven. He he brings hope, he brings hope to all who who turn to him. He brings hope to the the Gentiles, hope to the the nations. Think of how the gospel has spread throughout the nations. Here's Matthew writing about Jesus Christ, and there he is in Capernaum, the, the region of Galilee. A 
little obscure place. Matthew says, and in him, in his name, the nations will put their hope. And that, that's happened, hasn't it? The gospel has, has come to the nations. The gospel's come to our nation. The gospel is still going to the nations. And people of all nations are putting their hope in Jesus Christ and, and being saved. In his name, the nations will put their hope. Left to, its, what, to itself, the, the world is such a hopeless place. You, you, you see it sometimes, don't you? You, you, you? you see it visibly, almost, on, on the faces of some people. Just a, a look of utter hopelessness. And, and for all the progress that there has been in the world, real hope is something that people find that they... They, they cannot discover. For all the, the progress that there's been in politics and technology and, and medicine, people remain the same as they've always been. For, for those of us who've lived in this country all of our lives, our lives are for the most part more comfortable than the lives of our grandparents. We have more things than, than they ever had. More opportunities than they had. But are people today any happier than they were a generation or two ago? Are they any kinder? Are they any more content? People today have any more hope in the face of death and judgment and eternity than, than people of past generations had. You know, the, the world cannot produce such hope. But there is hope. There is hope for a hopeless world. There's, the, there's hope for, for you this morning. There's hope because there is someone who is altogether lovely. There is someone who is delightful in, in every way. There is someone who is perfect and excellent in, in every way and, and in everything he's ever done. There is hope for the world because there, there is someone who, who brings justice. And who satisfies the, the justice of God and brings forgiveness to all who believe in him. There is hope for the world today because there is one who is kind and tender and forgives all who, who truly come to him. Faith and repentance. There is hope for the nations. Because of Jesus Christ. And there's hope for the hopeless because of Jesus Christ. There's, there's hope for, for you and for me because of, of Jesus Christ. In his name, the nations, people of all nations, will put their hope. Will you? Will you? Will you put your hope in this glorious one, Jesus Christ?